Hello and welcome to episode 339 of Fergo and the Freak. I'm that bloke from Rugby League Project, Andrew Ferguson. You can find me on Twitter at AndrewRLP. And join me as always is the glorious League Freak. You can also find me on Twitter at League Freak. How you going there, mate? Going very well, Andrew. It's a day of celebration. I know for you, it's, uh, I dare say this is the, the biggest celebration you've had this year. I can't think of anything that tops this. No, and can I just say, I'm very, very close to buying us some Georgia Loire Dragons membership for next year. <laughs> just, just to show my appreciation. Yeah. So and, are you going to tell the listeners what happened? Well, I was just going to say, I, hopefully by doing this, I can coax them into doing more of it for the club. Yeah. That's it. Um, so the big news today is after the uh, the great work by the West Tigers to to sign Moses and Buy several years ago for far too long on far too much money, um, the Dragons have decided that they want him more and they've picked him up for next year, so a year earlier than his contract ends. So they've, they've taken him um, off our hands a year early. So I dare say the Tigers are still paying a little bit of his wage. Yeah. But who gives yeah. a fuck? He's gone. Yeah, they're, they're paying part of his wage. I would love to know what percentage, but just having him off the books will be pretty good. And the other thing I would love to know is what is it that the Dragons have seen in Moses and Bai that they've said, you know what, we need some of that at our club because he isn't a good utility player and that's probably the best thing about him. Yeah, I, I wonder if they've got him because they think that he can offer the utility value in the backs that they kind of hoped Jack Bird would offer but clearly hasn't. Yeah, Bird always looks like he's out of position, doesn't he? He's just not good. No. Um, and I'd, I'd I'd say that and buys an upgrade on Bird, but Ooh, really, yeah. But in saying that, we're we're not we're not really talking about much here. See, I think Bird is a much better player. I'd much rather have Bird than and buy. Like if I don't know why the Dragons would buy and buy for their reserve grade team. Like, I, he's just not a first grader, if you ask I, me. I don't think that Moses and Bai has the sort of um, skill set that works in the NRL under the current rules. No no team will benefit from having him in the side. Um, I, I don't think you can, can carry around a utility back who doesn't quite know what position he's supposed to play. That's... That's a very much a Super League thing. It's not something that you have in the NRL anymore. You just yeah. can't carry someone like that. No. Like, no. your backs have got to be like, exceptionally good at the one thing they do, and that's that one position they play. And and by just sort of plays every role he does at about 60% of the ability of anybody else. So he's, you know, he's going to be okay most of the time, but, you know... You don't want to be running a whole season with an okay five mates or an okay fullback or an okay centre. Yeah. You actually need someone that's NRL quality the whole time. And that's the problem you've got with Mbai is he's he's okay at everything he does. I feel like he's a poor man's Will Smith at Parramatta. In, Similar. In, Similar. Yeah, in terms that he's kind of a utility player. If you watch if you watch Will Smith when he plays New South Wales Cup, he's so good. He's just a really good player, but he doesn't really have a position. And I think the difference between Mbai and Smith is that Smith doesn't fuck up, and he's, yeah. a, he's a bit quicker, whereas Mbai, it, he, like, he just fucks up so often. It's kind of incredible. I think Mbai would be better served. If, he, if they want to persevere with him in the halves, especially at 5'8", he's going to be better served by having a genuine halfback who can create next to him. Mm. I think if you start putting a little bit of pressure on him by to be a creator, yeah. he turns to shit fast. Yeah. Uh, but if he's only going to do a bit of creating and a bit of, you know, a bit of ball running and a bit of passing, just little bits of it, he's going to be okay. But if you have got to lean on him more than that, um, it can be, it can be, it can get into the catastrophic area at times. Like you, you can pull off one or two good plays but there'll be just as many bad ones. Um, I, I just I, I find not one positive about Moses and Bai. I think he must be I've a got, really cool dude to be around. 
Well, it's it's almost on that. Um, he is he is a good bloke. Yeah. Uh, he's he's very professional. He's um he's not the sort of person that's going to be in the in the media for anything wrong whatsoever. He's a he's a nice guy. He's a good bloke. Yeah. Um, and I dare say with the amount of shit that's been going on at the Dragons in the last year and a half. They've probably gone, you know what, we need to get rid of the dickhead element at the club. And mm-hmm. that's the one big plus that you get from having Moses and by there. Um, especially if you bring him in and go, you know what, we're going to make and buy. I'm not saying they're going to do this, but they, if they said, you know, we're going to make Moses and by the captain. Okay. And I want every single person to aspire to be as good as him, as, you know, as far as human being a human and being a professional goes. Yeah. If, if that's what they want to do, then that's the that's a good reason to get him. But that's got nothing to do with what goes on on the field, and that's the problem. And see, I had a lot of people saying, yeah, Moses and Bai is a really good play. You know, he's a real professional going, you know what, are we trying to build a rugby league team that wins football games, or are we trying to build the best Boy Scouts group we possibly can? Yeah, and people, it's weird how people can latch on to something like that when a player is absolutely shit like Moses and Bai is. Um, I would prefer to have somebody that can play football. I agree. I'm not saying that I want assholes either. We've got Russell Packer at the club. I can't wait for that fucking prick to leave. Yeah. Um, You've you got to have people who've got that killer instinct as an as an athlete, as a footballer, as a, you know, that's what you want. People will go out there and they win you games. Not blokes who are nice and friendly. Um, and that's all they've got. So I, I do want to I do want to say thanks to the Dragons. Because um, just for a little bit of a, a, a stroll back a few years, the Dragons tried to do the Tigers a, a real solid back, you know, 2010, 11-ish, somewhere around there. Mm-hmm. Um, when they tried to buy Tim Moulton off the Tigers. And uh, when Tim Moulton was at the Tigers around that period there, he, a lot of fans at the Tigers and Tim Moulton himself had a absurdly inflated view of just how good Tim Moulton was. <laughs> Seems to be and, a problem with ha- halves at the West Tigers. Huh? Um, yeah, especially halves that they moved to fullback, like Moses and By Mitchell yeah. Moses. Yeah. yeah. You go on. So the drama there though, was that the Tigers almost had got themselves rid of Tim Moulton. And then they went, hang on, we're supposed to be the shit team. And then they fought over him to try and get him back. And then he broke his leg. And then we carried his salary and all that sort of drama with us for another two years. Um, so full credit to the Dragons. They were committed to trying to help the Tigers back then. And they've gone, you know what? We need to go back and make sure we finish that. And then they're just a, a Samaritans club. They're lovely. I, I'm, I'm not going to, I know the other day when we're doing our, um, you know, which team do we like to see our team beat the most in that mm-hmm. that NRL players poll, uh, fans poll. Mm-hmm. I might have mentioned the Dragons. I now, I now take back any negative comments I've ever said about the Dragons as a club. They're now my second team. I love them. To be fair, we did mention every single other club. When we, we did, did that. but for now I'm, I'm taking the Dragons off the shit list. Yeah. I, I like just the think, dragons. I, I just think it's weird that what they're doing at the dragons, like they brought in a lot of older players, and it looks like they're immediately trying to get rid of those those older players. They want rid of Corey Norman, and they don't want Dufty for some reason. But then they bring in them by. I just don't see a clear path that they're going down. It's just very strange to me, and I wouldn't waste a, a top thirty. Uh, first grade spot on him by, and I wouldn't even waste a reserve grade spot on him. Um, so I just don't understand this purchase. But you know the Dragons do whatever they're going to do, and they're definitely in a better position now than they were, say, twelve months ago. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, I don't know. Their recruitment at the moment is looking very West Tigers ish. It is, yeah. Just get whoever's out there. Mm. So the Tigers, though, uh, I suppose there's plenty of positives for them out of this, and that is they've freed up nearly nearly a million dollars well, by so, getting well, rid of keep, Moses and Bai. 
but keep in mind they've got to pay some of his salary. So yeah, but, well, but even you, if even if it's half, you know, that's almost yeah. it's almost five hundred thousand dollars they're going to have spare. But now they've got five hundred thousand dollars to spend. Well, it's beyond that because they've also got Russell Packer's contract ends this year. Ooh. And I think he was on seven or eight hundred thousand. So now you're looking at one point three, one point four million. I tell you what, if there's a time that you want to start freeing up extra salary cap space, it's after the player market has been um drained oh, yeah. all of the top talent. You want it to you really want to go into the last few months of the year and just have about a million bucks sitting there and seeing what other teams just get rid of players that they it's don't bit- want. The the timing's a bit off for the Tigers. So usually, once they once they've done, gone through the process of clearing cap space, it's usually once there's a really bad player on the market that cannot find a team. Mm-hmm. And Chad Townsend's been signed by two clubs, no less. <laughs> um, so it does mean there's only one other player out there that's unsigned for next year who they might be looking at, and they've been linked to before. Who? Because I've got one in my mind. Matt Moylan. Ooh. I've got a bad feeling, man. Bad, bad feeling. I was going to say Ash Taylor, but yeah. I don't think they'll go for Ash Taylor. I think they'll go for Matt Moylan. I've got no understanding why. It just seems like a very West Tigers signing. It does, doesn't it? Because what they do is they look at a highlights package Mm -hmm. of everything Matt Matt Moylan has done that was right and correct. They go, fuck, look at this bloke. Look what he can do. And they gloss over the um, the other 80% of the footage of him can being completely fucking useless. And they focus on that 20%. Man, if we can get that 20%, 100% of the time. Oh. They'll, be, they'll be looking at the clips of him playing for the Panthers still and saying, you know what? Him outside of Brooks? Yeah. That lets Dewey fucking play in the centers because we, we love having centers. And... Uh, yeah, this is going to work. Let's pay him. In fact, we don't want to lose him. I know he hasn't got any other offers. So let's pay him like a superstar and just give him the confidence of a superstar. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's my worry. I, <laughs> with with um, almost $1.5 million freed up, I'd be, I'd be hoping the club went about trying to find a halfback. Yeah, like you've got you've got halfback money now. Go fucking get one. If you can't get a halfback, get a hooker. And the club's got two young guys who've got plenty of potential in, but they've they only made their debuts this year. Um, and they are in their early twenties, so they've either got to decide, you know what, if we're going to go with these guys, then we've got to put them in now. I think Simpkins twenty one or twenty two. If you're going to go with him, put him inside now. Are you going to go with Little? Because if you stick him with him, you know, we've got another hooker there who is almost in it already. You know, do you persevere with him? Do you palm him off? Is he going See, to want to sit behind Little the whole time? Do you got to back up half back behind Brooks? Do you want to hang on to him? Or, you know, what are we going to do there? They're in this weird transition phase where they've got to decide, do we want to go to the next level up or do we want to pers- persevere with middle of the road? See, this and, is what I do if I'm the West Tigers, all right? I I go to Brandon Smith and I say, we'll pay you 900000 bucks a year. And I go to uh, the other bloke. What's the other bloke's name? Harry Grant. Harry Grant. I go to Harry Grant and say, Harry, we'll pay you a million dollars a year. And I just let them sort out who's leaving the storm because one of them will for that money. And because, I think you would probably get Harry for less than that, to be honest, because he's not played a great deal this year and he hasn't been as impressive this year. No, he hasn't. And but the thing is, I w- I want him to storm into the storm, funnily enough, the front office and say, "I'm leaving. You've got to sort it out." And they're going to say, "But, but, but," and he's going to say, "A million bucks." Tell me how you're going to sort out a million bucks a year for me. And if because if the storm then turn around and say, "This guy is a young Queensland, probably going to play for Australia or hooker in the very near future." and he could be here for 10 years for us, we have to let Brandon Smith go, then you get Brandon Smith. Yeah. You know, I, I would I would put all of that financial pressure on the storm. I'm, but I'm guessing what they will do 
is they will just wait and recruit somebody in like January. Yeah. But uh, I I think Brandon Smith is more of the type of player that Bellamy works with best. So I think he'd be more inclined to stick with Brandon Smith than than Harry Grant. Look from week from week, I can go either way on them. Of like course, week, of course. week from week, because they're both just they're, they're you. I, you could make a really good argument they could be the two best hookers in the game. Um, but I can see where both players like there's sometimes I'm, I've talked about it on here where I watch Brandon Smith and I think this dude's going to be busted by the time he's like. 28, same way Isaac Luke was. I loved watching Isaac Luke, but he threw himself into the game in a way that really, by the time he was 28, he was playing like a 32-year-old. And uh, I think Harry Grant's going to have a longer career. But right now, Brenda Smith is playing way better than Harry Grant. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think the other thing that's worth noting too, and it hasn't really been mentioned as much as I thought it would be, is the Roosters are going to be big players on the player market this year and next year. Yeah, well, they've they've picked up Connor Watson from the Knights. And Bloody. apparently they, they got... <laughs> they, I don't know, big splash there. Um, but they got him from the Knights, and apparently they got him for less than the Knights offered for him to stay I, there. They'd have got and, him for, like, a, you know, just an Oporto voucher. You know what? He turned huh. up and said, listen... What if I pay you lot to let me pump? That's how it works sometimes. you got to be there. It's, I know it sounds point. ridiculous, but you just got to be there when it happens. You know um, what? I'll take a second-hand VL. Yeah. <laughs> and if you can put a fuel, full tank of fuel in that, I'll, I'll go for another year. Maybe where they train in Bondi, it's like within 5Ks of something he really enjoys. So he's like, man, I can play for the Roosters and, like, you know, go to a park. No, it might be Galo Pies, opposite the Leagues Club. Could be. Um, but, yeah, so Quite it's going to be nice there. for Connor Watson to not be played in 57 different positions, eh? Yeah, yeah, that's... I mean, he's just another Moses and Bai, really. Who can, who can tackle a bit? <laughs> See, I think he's better than that. I think he's a lot better than that. I think he's been pretty hard done by at the Knights. The problem is they've put him, they've put him in more positions than... Careful. I censored my, censored myself. Sorry. Careful. I censored myself. <laughs> well, I have, I have Connor Watson, Moses, and by Kurt Mann, all just a, the same sort of player, different bodies, but do the same sort of thing. Jack Bird's quickly heading in the same direction. Yeah. Um, what else has been going on? James Maloney retired. He announced his retirement. Ah, um, did you have a barbecue? Probably. Um, he announced his retirement. He actually did this a couple of years ago when he said he was going over to playing Super League. So it's not a real shock. Do you really, if you're an Australian that's playing in Super League, do you have to announce your retirement? I wonder. Um, I wonder if he's done it because if he plays for, I don't know if this rule's changed or not, but I think if you spend four years living in a country and you don't yeah. play representative football for you know, the country that you're from. Yeah. Then you can become eligible to play for that country that you've been living in for the last four years. I was wondering if maybe he he was getting close to being called up to play for France. That would be funny. And then... Because Steve Menzies was, was, at the end of his time at Catalan, was eligible to play for France. Well, remember that Australian winger? Uh, I wish I could remember his name. I could see his face. But he played for the Catalan Dragons for a long time. And I think he actually did end up playing for France. It was ridiculous. That's Justin Murphy or someone? That's it, Justin Murphy. Yeah. That's the one. Um, Is he the one that um, smashed into the fence and then went head first into the stands? I think he did. He, yeah, he did a big tumble roll. That's one of the worst ones ever. Oh, I just thought... Man, at some stage, you've got to look at a fence and go, yeah, you know what? I need to try to avoid hitting that at full speed. And he's going, no, nah, fuck it, I'll get through it. <laughs> I'll be right. <laughs> the thing is, though, like the in goals in England are terribly small. And they then, are, like, but, you know, they, if you've played them play long enough, as much as he has, you'd know that. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. But anyway. Um, but, yeah, he announced his retirement. He had a really interesting career. He was, a, he was just one of those guys that, you know, he'd turn up and – he got the job done. It was really interesting. Yeah. Um, you know, he, he, I think that 
next year there will probably be teams that will give him a call. Just see. Yeah. They'll probably, probably be English teams. You reckon? You reckon yeah. no NRL team would just say, hey, James, where are you up to? You, you feel like uh, throwing the footy around a little bit? We'll throw you 300 grand? No, I don't think so. Okay. No. Only because the game here has changed too much. Um, so you, you kind of need to have... He would be a turnstile, hey? Yeah. Yeah. Because, I mean, all we've got now is the, the halves are defending just a little bit wider of the ruck, and they're just being completely isolated by second rowers. Yeah. Because that's all they're doing. You see every team now, they're moving the second rowers wider and wider. They're yep. getting out to the Ellis Corridor now. Yeah, I've seen, I mean, we've seen second rowers that are, are starting to get into that Ellis zone. Yeah. Um, and the Ellis zone is usually the, the zone that is between where your winger normally is and the touch judge. Yeah. I mean, especially in the last few weeks, we've seen um, Luciano Lalua and Billy Kikau spending a lot of time at centre in attack. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. And probably, and being sent is being generous because they've given their winger so little room to move that basically should be just called wingers at that stage. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they're getting very wide. Yeah, it's, um, uh, the thing is, I feel like very few of them are being used properly. Like to be a, a wide run and second roll like that, I feel as though you can't really make a player like that. Like, you know who's really good in that sense, and you would never think at looking at him, is Jesse Bromwich. He's amazing out wide. Yeah. And he shows a bit of ball-playing skill. He can punch through the line. He He's a good decoy runner. Uh, and he just gets the job done. It's really weird that he can do that. Whereas if you looked at his brother, you'd be like, he could never do that job. I just think that there's certain players are good at that role and other players, they try and shoehorn into that role. I think we're seeing too many shoehorned players running wide. Like Tal Malolo playing out wide, that's ridiculous. Yeah. I think the for me, there's only one, one thing that really stands out where most of their players in the forwards, especially in the in their back rowers, mm. are all pretty good at it. And it's, the Sharks have got really good wide running back roles because they don't unlike Lo Lua and Kikau who kind of run straight or drift towards the sideline with the hope of trying to get an arm free and get an offload away to the winger. Yeah. The Sharks back rowers start wide. Instead of going towards the winger, they come back in field. Mm-hmm. They go against against the grain of the opposition's defence. And I I reckon the Sharks edge edge forwards, I hate that term. Um the Sharks edge forwards, their second rowers, would probably be getting through the line more often than most other teams' second rowers would be because they are running that straighter line or they're angling back in, in towards the post a bit there. Yeah. I and mean, they'd be creating more opportunities and stuff. They're just going in the opposite direction to what everyone else is doing. But that seems to be the only the only strong point in the Sharks' attack at the moment. Is when yeah. they do that, and they, unfortunately, yeah, they keep changing you, their halves around, so they can't maximise that and work on it properly. True, I tell you, another player who's good at that is Martin at the Panthers. Mm. He's, oh, he's very good at at Martin, uh, one Martin's just one of those ball runners at the moment. You can put him anywhere and make him just say, just just run on whatever line you want, and just make sure you do it fast. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah I know the drill, and just sit there. And he just runs through fucking brick walls. That bloke just runs through a brick wall. Yeah, well, that's the thing about him is like he can do he can do like the dirty work in the middle, but he's out wide. And the the key thing for him is that he doesn't just run towards the sideline. Like, and as you say, that's what some wide run and second rows do. You know, Martin straightens up the attack. Yeah. And and that's the big key in being, or you're either straightening up the attack or you're going in the opposite direction to what the defense is sliding in. And that's where you catch out the, the right player you know, you hit their outside shoulder and they're normally a little bit smaller than you are. So you spin them around and you're through. But uh, yeah, it's a, I, I just think that it's something that you can't just tell a player, well, you're a wide runner in the second row. I think some players have it and some players don't. So, And they've got to have that willingness to just, um, you know, have no self-preservation and just hit that line hard. Talakai is another one at the Sharks. Yeah. 
I mean, he's so good out wide, and he's built like a, a front rower or a lock. Mm-hmm. He plays as a second rower. But because he's so good at running those lines, they've been able to play him at centre more often yeah. than not this year, and it's 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 not been a weakness for him. You know, it's just insane how, how good some of these guys are and how they've been utilised. Um, Isaiah Papali at, at Parramatta is another good example. Yeah, he is, yeah. Yeah, he's, uh, I mean, he was such a big part of their attack, and I think that that's why, you know, and I wouldn't say he's playing badly at the moment, but now that he isn't setting the world on fire at the moment, their attack is just dead because he initiated so much of what they were doing with his ball running. Um, it, it's a it's a really interesting part of the game that's sort of coming back, and you can see why coaches are trying to force it to happen. But uh, not everyone can do it. I think it's it's one of those things where you've either got the guy or you don't. Yeah. I think with Papa either it's more the fact that the halves aren't really doing much anymore. They're, just, they're doing the same sort of system over and over again, hoping that it'll work. Yeah, and it's, I mean, that's the problem with Parramatta is that, and we talked about it last year, I, you know, teams worked out Parramatta. And I think this year, start the year, he was so devastating out wide. It, but they've worked it out. Like this, I mean, there's nothing going on around him, and that's the big problem. That's right. Um, it, I was going to sorry. say just quickly too on Parramatta. It's interesting yeah. to see that um, they've only scored 32 points more than the West Tigers this year. Yeah, it's outrageous. Because like, if you go through their team, and I think there's a few players in their team that are overrated, but they've still got a bunch of quality players. Um, and it's not like they've had devastating amounts of injuries for that team. No. So, you know, uh, I I would be shocked if uh, Wayne Bennett isn't coaching them next year. Big call. Yeah, I know. I'd be like, if he's not coaching them yes, year, next year, I'd be really shocked. I think what's going to happen is they're going to, you know, just get kicked out the finals. They're not as good as any of the top four. So they're going to go out the finals pretty quickly. Uh, Brad Arthur's going to get sacked. And I think that the power brokers at Parramatta, they'll start hearing the, you know, the rattling on the door because everyone wants to be on the Parramatta board. There's always, you know, 57 former players that think that they can get off of the fucking ride on lawnmower and all of a sudden run an NRL club. <laughs> and so the, the board is going to want to make a splash and Wayne Bennett is going to be there, and they're, they're a club that is in a financial position that they can say, hey, Benny, we're going to give you a million. And Wayne Bennett's going to go, fuck yeah, I can stick around Sydney for another couple of years for a million bucks. Oh, you don't think they'll go after Flano squared? I don't. I really don't. I think that, um, I think that, I think teams weirdly are actually looking at Flanagan and saying, no, thank you. Because you think of how NRL clubs don't normally give a stuff about anything to do with integrity. And yet he is still, you know, he's on Fox Sports and he's getting pushed by Buzz Rothfield every single week and nothing's come of it. And let, let's just be clear about this for a sec. The reason why Buzz Rothfield is pushing for Flano to get a gig everywhere it's not because not not just because he's his mate, but because it means Buzz can get inside scoops. There's a reason why the Sharks were, were in the news all the time for every other tiny minor thing um, when Flano was coaching, because Flano was always talking to the journos. That's just a way for Buzz to be able to get free story or easy stories that have to do any leg work. That's yeah, true. Reason for that. Um, the other thing that's interesting for me, and I'm I'm surprised there hasn't been more talk about this, is um. Adam O'Brien's inability to coach attack, because I don't think people understand or realise this, but the Knights have the second worst attack in the comp. The Broncos have scored yeah. more points than them. The Cowboys have scored more points than them. We've talked. What you and me were the first people talking about Adam O'Brien. We really were. Mm. We're doing it a while ago, and you know they. To be fair, Callan Ponga was out of the side, and Mitchell Pearce was out of the side. But now that they're back, they're, you're not seeing anything different. You're not seeing 
You know, the only difference you're really seeing is Bradman Best is starting to come along as a devastating ball runner. But it's not like you're watching them and saying, oh, yeah, you can see the coaching job that he's doing here or they're improving even. They're just not. And, like, remember early on when we were saying how Adam O'Brien was going absolutely crazy at the plays in the first, like, month of the competition and we were saying you only have a few of those, you know, times where you can start throwing shit around the room before the team just tunes you out. And he was, you know, doing it in the first few weeks of the competition. Um, I think it's fair to ask questions of him now because there's just no improvement. And they've brought players in and those players have not gotten any better and in most cases have gotten worse. And then you look at um, Connor Watson leaving for reportedly less money. It's not a great situation. And you just got to wonder, like, at some point, you've got to look at this mix of talent that they've got, and they've got some talent there, and say, what's going wrong? And eventually, the coach's name comes up. It's got to. I mean, somehow they've got themselves into the top eight. Mm-hmm. Just. But their attack is so pedestrian. Uh, I'd say Parramatta are more exciting to watch an attack than the Knights at the moment. Yeah. And then that... That Knights attack, especially this year where scoring points has not exactly been hard. No. You know, it's there's only four teams that haven't reached 400 points yet for the year, and it's the bottom three teams in Newcastle. Yeah, and, and you look at their lineup and you're like, okay, first point of attack, Braley, he's a good player. you got Callum Ponga there, who's a really good fullback, and he's going to be, a, you know, like a second 5'8". Mm. You say what you want about Mitchell Pierce, you know, but at the very least, he's an experienced halfback. They've got good forwards. I mean, they've got, say, Tyson Frizzell. You can say they've got Clamour. The Saifidi brothers are solid, you know. Um, Bradman Best is a really good ball runner. And it's, yeah, just, well, it's well, coming to nothing. Good, they've even got good back rowers. Like Barnett and Fitzgibbon are very good second rowers. Yeah. That just... I don't know. It's just not clicking. I don't know what it is. They've got the cattle. They're just very unimaginative in attack. Yeah, they really are. And, like, they brought in um, Jake Clifford from the Cowboys mid-season. Mm. And it was interesting because he immediately started playing well. Like, he looked like a different player than he did at the Cowboys. And I remember watching Jake Clifford and trying to work out, does he have it or not? Because and that's one of the it's one of the rare things about rugby league in a halfback is really the only situation where you either have it or you don't. And you know, other positions yeah. you can make it up with athleticism, but halfback you can't. And I wasn't sure because there'd be some games you'd see things and you'd be like, Oh, that's not bad and then other games he was completely terrible. I think he's been much better at the Knights. And if I was the Knights, I would be looking to move on Mitchell Pierce and saying a con uh What's his name? I just said his name. Clifford. Clifford, Jay Clifford. I'd be saying he's our halfback going forward. And I would actually, um, I, I would get rid of Pierce. But, you know, is the coach wanting to do that? I don't know. It just seems like there's no direction there either. Why do so many NRL clubs not have direction? I don't know. It's It's got me beat. Um, I've never understood the... Uh, Obsession with Adam O'Brien. A lot of people talk about, you know, he's from the, the Bellamy stable. But wasn't Stephen Kearney as well? Exactly. Just because they come from a good coaching stock doesn't mean that they have good coaching ability. And I'm not saying that Adam O'Brien is in the, the Kearney level because he hasn't coached enough for us to be able to judge that thoroughly at the moment. Mm. But what we're seeing at the moment, he's he's more Kearney than he is Bellamy. Definitely, and I'll tell you something else is I always worry when they say, oh, this guy's going to be a really good first-grade coach. Just trust me, trust me. Everyone loves him. He's great. He's going to be great. He's going to be great because, honestly, nobody knows. Like, nobody knew Wayne Bennett was going to be a great first-grade coach. Nobody knows. You just fucking find that a dude has the ability. And, uh, 
you know, that's the thing about someone like a Fitzgibbon at next year at the Sharks. That you know, there's this thing of like, oh well, he's the next great coach. It's like, why? Just because people say it. Yeah, that that's pretty much it. So was Trent Barrett. Trent Barrett was supposed to be the next great coach. He's fucking terrible. He's made uh, that that Bulldogs team worse. Let, let's be honest. Though. I mean, it, it's easy to get distracted by Trent. Well, he's got them beautiful eyes, doesn't he? <laughs> he does. I, I reckon he uses them as, as you know, to, to perform, you know, my tricks. He just looks at you and says, look into my eyes, you know, oh, he's so dreamy. It's like he that. says, I'm a good coach. You, go, you are a good coach, Trent. Sign <laughs> me up for three years. Okay, we'll sign you for three years. Those eyes, mate. He's just signed here, Trent. Yeah. <laughs> you walk away going, what the fuck have I just done? <laughs> it's like that scene in uh, Semi Pro where they decide to all wear eyeliner to freak the other team out. <laughs> have you ever seen that? Yeah. It's so funny. Fuck, that's a good movie. Uh, that's good stuff. Um, now, one of the things I wanted to talk about is the Storm have the ability to to equal the record of 19 straight wins this season. Uh, mm-hmm. this year. They have got that ability to do it against the Titans. Now, they have said that they're not naming Brandon Smith because I think he's got some sort of injury. I can't remember what one it is. They've rested. It seems oh, they've rested, rested several players. Well, I don't know if he's rested or not, but they've got a lot of players who aren't playing this weekend. Well, Finnecane is out with a, a head knock. Olam's out. Jerome Hughes is out. They're playing the Titans. So, you know, and it, they should still beat the Titans. But I, I feel like Bellamy's the sort of dude that they're coming up on the record and he's like, I don't like the idea of having the longest winning streak in the whole game's history and having to carry that into the grand final. Yeah, I think at some point he's going to want a loss. Mm. I think he's just going to try and pick and choose who he loses to, because it's going to, you know, it's probably going to be a team that he has to play in the finals. I'm, If I were him, I'd probably want to beat the Titans, because mm-hmm. I think their forward pack can trouble teams when it's tuned in and doing, doing what it's supposed to. Yeah. And I'd be saving that loss for the last round against the Sharks. Because if you can get the Sharks to just scrape in, I don't think they're going to trouble anyone in the finals. Yeah, I, I, I think the Sharks would be out straight away as well. Um, you know, the I just think it's interesting. I've, I feel, And I've always felt this about Bellamy. Like, there's been times where he's rested players coming into the finals before. And I think that he's always looked for that perfect balance of not losing the form of these players, but at the same time, you want to keep the momentum going into the finals and stuff. And I, and it was a, even things like coming out of the gates. Remember there was a few years the Storm come out the great gates, looked amazing, and they'd get towards the end of the season and they just looked a bit ran out, you know? Yeah. And I think he's just finally worked it out at this point of his career, and he has the last few years. Um, and it's just really interesting to see him coming to this game, and I just, I don't know, there's a feeling I've got where he's like, I don't want 19 wins. I don't want to be that team. I think, yeah, I think he's probably, I don't think he'll mind getting the win, but I don't think he'll want to go into the finals mm-hmm. having won 22 straight games. No, no, I think that would be, and so, can, you imagine, can you imagine if they got into the grand final? especially if it was in Melbourne and they're still unbeaten on that unbeaten yeah. streak. I think, I think he, he would hate that. As I said, I think if, if he was smart, he'd he'd beat the Titans to try yeah. and keep keep them out of the finals race because, as I said, I think their forward pack can, can worry teams. Mm-hmm. Doesn't matter how hard he tries, he's going to beat Parramatta. So he's probably going to want to rest everyone he can and try and let the Sharks win, if possible. <laughs> Um, in round 25, so the Sharks might just scrape in. Because the Sharks, have, I believe, have got the softest draw of the teams that are still in contention of the finals. Oh, really? They've got the Tigers this week, then they've got Brisbane. And then after that is Melbourne in round 25, who in previous years have rested quite a lot of plays for their last match before the finals. So, and given that the Sharks' points difference is... Minus 62. Mm-hmm. Only the Titans have got a better points difference than them. So the, 
you know, they don't need to go out and flog anyone. They just need to get wins, and they'll their points difference will be enough to see them jump Canberra. If, who's Canberra got in their last runs in their run home? Manly, the Warriors, and the Roosters. You know, I saw a report today saying the Seagulls had named Tom Trebojevic yes. in their team. Uh, I think I feel like they're going to take him out. I, I, I feel like he's not going to play, but I don't know. It's just it's a worry. I'd, I'd rest him. I, I I think I'd rest him too. Look, you've you've made the finals now. You don't need to to risk him now. Yeah. Speaking of uh, coming into the business end of the season, we really should mention the Fergo and the Freak tipping competition on the NRL website because it's a really tight race. It's still anyone's. There's still a number of people that can win it. Oh, I'm still a chance, am I? I got, I got some really bad news for you, Andrew. <laughs> I'll, I'll be honest. I have not paid any attention to what's going on. I've been putting my tips in, yeah. but I've not looked at the leaderboard because I've gone, yeah, you know, you know what? I'm miles off on this. And yeah. I know I'm not going to win it, so I'm just going to keep putting my tips in and doing the doing the right thing by the tipping comp. I looked at the tipping comp. Well, I think it was yesterday or the day before. I was like, oh, I'll check out the tipping comp. Had a look, and I was like, did did Andrew, is he still on this list? Hang on, where is he? <laughs> I was always at the bottom end of it. Yeah, I think like, last fuck? time I looked, I was in the bottom four or something. I assume I'm still there. You are in, hang on, let me find you. Let me find you. Where the hell are you? There you are, Andrew RLP. You're in 23rd position. Out of how many? 39. Oh, wow. I've improved. Yeah, yeah. You've done well. It's got the little green arrow saying you've gone up. Oh, so, okay. Only, I'm coming home with a wet sail. So, Andrew Marzalak. Marzalak. He is in first <laughs> place. He's had, got a total of 134 tips this year. He is two ahead of Sean M, who is one ahead of Daniel Watson Hayes, and he is one ahead of both the Glorious League Freak and Reagan, who, who is a friend of mine. Right. So, like, how, how many can you realistically make up in the last few weeks? You'd need, say everyone above there has a shocker. I reckon you could probably make up six, how many, six, seven, I don't know. If everything goes your way, I reckon you could make up seven tips. All right, let's see. Oh, I've got a bit of a gap there to, to Samuel Sampson. I'm four tips behind him. So it looks like I could probably jump two guys. Yeah. I think that's probably going to be my limit. See, I I'm just, I feel like I could make up the four to Andrew at the top with of Mars Broncos. And I'm thinking that, like James Cunningham, he's still in it in sixth place. Seventh place, David Kingston, he's still in it. Andrew Gutzel, he's still in it. Aaron. Oh, Aaron, sorry. Uh, Nadine. Ooh. She's coming over with a wet sail. She, she needs to. <laughs> but if Nadine's in it, so is Jeremy and so is Brett. But then Sarah. Sarah's had, Sarah Miller was leading it for a long time. She's fallen off the pace the last few weeks, unfortunately. So now we're getting to the people who are... Well, see, these people are still all within eight tips of the first place. Yeah, but can you make up eight tips? That's a whole round. Sure. You'd need everyone else above you to be terrible. And look, look anything's possible. I guess. And, and how are you going in the who tipped what one? I'm uh, going good in that one too. I haven't looked at this all year, so I'm going to have a look at it now. Okay. NRL expert tips. The experts. Oh, you're, you're equal fourth with Paul Crawley. Yes. That's a <laughs> fucking endorsement, isn't it? <laughs> Your Paul Crawley's equal. How does that make you feel? <laughs> Makes me wish I could get COVID. Um, yeah. It's, am I on it's, here? Oh, I am on here. I'm down near the bottom. So I I'm, put in the same tips for this one as I do the 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 Fergun Freak one. For the for the main reason that I'm trying to win both of them, you know. Um the thing I like about this Who Tipped What website though, 
and it's who tipped what.com you can go check it out um i love that there are people on there i know are angry because i'm above them <laughs> it's great i jumped four places last week nice i'm uh, ahead of lara pitt mm-hmm. um ferg on the freaks very own james smith mm-hmm. uh von sampson tim castillo from league unlimited um Jimmy Smith, Hannah Hollis, Dean Ritchie, Michael Chamis, all those people who are experts, Brent Reed, Phil Rothfield, Darcy McDonald. She, she's, um, I think she might have forgotten to put her tips in a few times there. Okay. Ben, ben Iken, he's, uh, I don't know, they put him on there and he hasn't, he hasn't done anything. He's dead last pretty much. He's, he's, He's above away teams and below home teams. You know what? He probably stopped uh, putting tips in anywhere when he went to the Broncos a few weeks ago, hey? I don't blame him. Yeah. Yeah, like Darcy, who was on uh, a while ago on the podcast talking about cheerleading, she's – I thought she would have been doing better. Poor Albie. Albie's not good at tipping. He runs the website and he's not good at tipping. You think um, you doctor it a little bit. Hey? You'd think if you were running the website, you'd think you'd doctor it so that you are the you are the benchmark. You th- yeah, you'd think so. Like what just the go, fuck? Oh, I picked the tokens. No, 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 I didn't do that. Just change that. Oh, look, full set for me again. Oh, geez, I'm good at this tipping game. <laughs> there, there was actually it was funny. One week I had a look at the website, and it had said that I'd sell, I tipped the Bulldogs to beat the Storm, <laughs> and I was like, Albie, that did not happen. <laughs> Like bold, bold move. Yeah, yeah, and, and like everyone tipped the storm except me, and uh, I don't know what had happened. I think I know what had happened because when I put my tips in, because you get a thing and it comes up with all of the tips. I think what I had done is when I'd scrolled down, it had changed the tip on that game um, because it happened again a few weeks ago, and I was like, oh, I didn't know that had happened, you know, because so, I always double-checked them after that had happened with the Bulldogs game. But, yeah, but he changed it back for me. He was good. That's always good. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've I've really not been following it. I also started this year, I, I, I decided that I was going to um, take part in, was it the fantasy football thing? But more to try and uh, just the one on the NRL website. Okay. But it wasn't to try and win. It was trying to figure out um, if there's certain players you could pick that kind of break the system a little bit. So I've been sort of fidgeting around with a few different players here and there and try and sort of understand some of the mechanics of it. Yeah. And then it become a dad again and couldn't be fucked. So all that research stuff I'd done, I was in a file somewhere. I forgot where I put it. It's gone, so it was just a waste of time. So it's just me sitting there withering away, going backwards, I assume. Damn. But oh, well. Something to do for next year. Maybe next year. Maybe we can both do a fantasy team each on the NRL website, and we'll see how we go. That's an idea. The problem is there's so much involved in it. It's like bringing players in, taking players out and stuff. Like the tips you do them in and that's done, you know, whereas the fantasy stuff, you've got to go deep. That's what she said. Exactly. Um, I think um, <laughs> I, I think when they first started bringing in the fantasy ones, they had these things where you had a draft mm. and you were one of like 20-odd people and you picked from the pool of players that were available. Yeah. And that were the players you were stuck with for the rest of the year from memory. Yeah. yeah. I didn't I didn't mind that concept. This time yeah, chopping I, and changing every week. It's yeah. too time consuming for me. I can't be bothered doing that. I was in one where we used to you draft your players and they were your players. You could trade them with other clubs and then uh we had a a game simulator and, and all the players were rated in different categories and we had a game simulator and we'd simulate the games and so I got really, really, really deep into that, and that was probably the early 2000s. So I kind of got that out of my system. Yeah. You know what would be good mm. is to play reverse fantasy, play Nightmare Rugby League, where <laughs> you have to try and spend the maximum amount of your salary cap to yeah. build the lowest scoring team possible. Why don't we do that next year instead? 
I think we should do that. Okay, but here's the thing. They you you have to pick players that are actually playing first grade. So yeah, you can't just pick players that aren't playing. You've got to pick the worst guys that are going to be playing this week. That, that's right. You've got to. That's the thing. You've got to spend all of the cap. You can't spend and and have, you know, if there's ten million in the cap, that you can't have eight million left over. You've got to spend it all. Okay. Uh, you know what we should do? We should get in touch with uh, NRL CEO Fantasy Comp and see if they could set us up a fantasy rugby league competition. That is the nightmare rugby league competition, and we could see if we can sort something out with them. I think that's a brilliant idea. Yeah, of course it's a brilliant idea. I came up with it. Yeah, copyrighted. No one else yeah. is allowed to do that. You, what well, you know, what we should do now is you should go and buy the URL. Fuck off! <laughs> Did you see I was talking about my URLs during the week? <laughs> it's like, uh, yeah, okay, I might as well say. It. So I own. I own International RL and uh, RL World Nines. And I was saying anybody that wants to run an International Rugby League website or World Nines website, just get in touch. And somebody said that um, that Steve Mascord owned some website, some Nines website address. And um, I think he just owns a, a URL like I do. Yeah, because uh, I didn't end up, I didn't see a website that come up for him. But anyway, he was saying how um, Paul Broughton had copyrighted the term World Nines, and so even the International Rugby League can't use it. <laughs> and I was like, I don't really care, you know. It's, that's what people are going to look up Rugby League World Nines and they'll come to my website. I don't give a shit what fucking, you know, the copyright yeah. is. Well, you know, you, you had the website for copyrighted, I guess. So if, if he wants it, no, look, I th- I think that he copyrighted the term a number of years ago. And, okay. But, but I, I'm still allowed to have the website address. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. He's open to buy it off you. I'd sell it for 20 grand. There you go. Get in touch, Paul. Um, you got to yeah, spend you... 20 grand, Paul. Don't act like you don't. We all know you. We all call your money bags Paul Broughton. <laughs> check oh look nightmarerl.com would be available fuck <laughs> no i'm not going to you've got no idea what it's like to be like yeah things are going well wait a minute 75 dollars went out of my account why is that oh yeah madquackers.com fucking <laughs> <laughs> superleaguewar.com super superleaguewar.com they're all going out People, things, people don't even know I own this shit. Uh, I'll tell you what, if you if you want to build a rugby league website and you need help doing that from, from the ground up, get in touch with League Freak. Not only can he show you how to get all the content on there and produce your own content and how to publish it on there, he'll even give you the website. Yeah, I like the URLs. If someone wants to run an international rugby league website out there and you've got to really show that you can do this shit, like I don't want you to just be like being like, oh, yeah, I want to do it and stuff. Like I will literally set up the website for you to fill out yourself. You'll have everything at your fingertips to use. I will give it to you. All I ask is that I can have the the advertising area on the website and I'm not even saying all that at all of it, just somewhere I can – you know, do the League Freak Network stuff on there. But you can run it and, you know, make it your own and stuff. I just haven't got time to do it. There you go. Well, there's I've got an offer for it. I'm just there's, too lazy. There's an offer for a rugby league community. Yeah. Even if the – what's the International Rugby League? If they want to buy it off me, I, wow. they can buy it off me for £200,000. <laughs> It's what if they you know. what if they contact you and said, look, we don't have 200,000 pounds, but we do have two fully stocked vending machines? Here's what I'd say. Here's what I'd say. Listen, first of all, I want a place on the board. And I want Andrew to have a place on the board as well. They'll probably say yes. They probably will. <laughs> huh? So badly, right? <laughs> Is there any chance you can run this from your own house? Go, yeah, sure. We all know how the International Rugby League works. I I won't say anything else. 
We'll just leave it there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm thinking about, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't want to do that. <laughs> no. no. We've, we've done well. We've not offended too many people of like, we'll, we'll stay there for, we'll stay in this little, this green pasture for a little while. Yeah, true. We don't want to offend anyone. By the way, you know what's funny? <clears throat> English people go to other countries and call themselves expats. Oh, really? They, yeah, they call them. So, have, you've noticed that? I have, yeah. Yeah. It's because they don't want to be called what they really are. English. Fucking immigrants. <laughs> they think of themselves as better than that. So they call themselves expats. How funny is that? Expats. Yeah. Interesting, that one. Think about it. Mm. No one could. It's like expats. Who else calls themselves expats? No one except the Poms. Interesting. Interesting. Yep. Just thought I'd bring that up. Pop that one out there as well. Yeah. Uh, By the way, um, all of rugby league in New South Wales has been abandoned for the rest of the year. Oh, has uh, it? Every single grade. Yep. So there will be no more rugby league in New South Wales for the rest of the year. And I'm just waiting to see um, what measures and, and what announcements the International Rugby League will make knowing that the biggest junior rugby league nurseries in the entire world have been abandoned for the rest of the year. Because I know that they're really, really keen on making sure that rugby league continues to grow. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that would be fascinating. Mm. Um, I assume then there's going to be talk coming up soon about where the grand final is going to be played. Well, they keep on... The only things I've heard is Suncorp, Melbourne and possibly New Zealand. I don't think it's going to be New Zealand because they've just gone into a lockdown. Yeah. Um, so I just can't imagine that they're going to be open to something like that happening for them. If they're talking Melbourne, are they talking MCG, Docklands, or are they talking Amy Park? I haven't heard. I don't think it would be Amy Park. I think it would be the MCG. Are they playing AFL right now in Melbourne? I believe so. Because yeah, I, I mean, be... I mean, I know I live in the city, <laughs> yeah. but I've not paid any attention whatsoever to AFL for the best part of the last forty years. Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> you're like everybody that lives above the Murray River. Yeah, yeah. I thought it was going to be hard to come into this state, mm-hmm. live here, and try and navigate every single Victorian constantly talking about the weird, um, whatever it is they call sport. Mm. Um, but it's actually been quite easy. Really? Yeah. Because I work with a bunch of people who, um, a lot of them are, uh, second generation Australians or they're first generation, um, Australians. Like they've come from another country, stuff like that. So they don't even watch it themselves. They look at it and go, what the fuck is this? Mm. So they don't watch it. I've spent more time, I and mean, this is honest to God, I've spent more time at work talking about kabaddi than talking about AFL. What's Kabaddi? It's a fucking insane Indian game. It's it's a full contact sport that doesn't yeah. have a ball. It's fucking mad, man. I, yeah. I I don't I can't understand I can't explain any more than that. Okay. But if you go to YouTube and look into it, you just look at it and go, the fuck is this? These people could play rugby league. Okay. Why That's don't we give them a ball? It's like it's like tag, yeah. but with tackling allowed. <laughs> Oh really? It's fucking insane. Have you ever I, seen... I don't understand any of it. I watch it and I'm going, I don't know what the fuck I'm watching, but I'm entertained. It's like that sport that they play and you know, they played in Afghanistan where um you you ride horses and you drag a dead goat from one side to the other. I think you've got to drag the dead goat into a circle or something. Sorry, just uh sit through a little there. Right, so you you drag a dead goat around. Yeah, yeah, you drag. It's you know what they showed it in the Rambo movie, uh, part Rambo Part Three, I think it was when he was out in Afghanistan, mm-hmm. and he plays it, and it's the that's the sport where you yeah you drag a dead goat, and uh, you ride a horse, and yeah, I don't know that's what it's cool. called though. Mm. That's something. That's something to look into. Yeah. Maybe one of our many well-educated listeners can let us know what it's called. Yeah. 
I tell you what, that'd be a fun sport to play, hey? I bet so many I bet so many players fall off their horses and get killed though. Would you especially rather with, especially with all the IEDs around? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> would you rather watch that or a game of polo? I would rather watch that. I would if somebody said, Look, we're gonna play a game of polo or we've got this goat, we're gonna kill it and we're gonna drag it around and chuck it into a circle, I'd say, Let's do the goat one. Actually, I've just looked. I've just done a Google search. It's called, um, I think it's called Buzkashi. Okay. B u b u z k a s h i. There you go. Um, unsourced material may be challenged and removed. Buzkashi, literally called goat pulling in Persian, is a Central Asian sport in which horse mounted players attempt to place a goat or calf carcass in a goal. There you go. See, I'm not. I'm not crazy. The sport that uses dead goats as a ball. Yeah, well, let's face it. We're used to use fucking, you know, pig pig guts. You blow a pig gut up and away you go. You're playing footy, playing rugby league. Absolutely. That's fascinating. Yeah. It would be crazy if we found out that the, uh, you know, the, the top paid players over there are the equivalent of what our top paid players in rugby league are <laughs> over here. <laughs> Imagine if they had, like, a complete, almost the exact same shit we've got. It's like... Oh yeah, they all had. To, everyone's now playing in cabal because uh, they of COVID. Well, they, they've got other problems right now in Afghanistan, which is very sad to see. But um, yes. yeah, imagine if they did have this entire industry of a game we didn't even know about. Yeah, that's fascinating. We should probably we could probably give this episode that the name of that sport as the title, just to confuse everyone. <laughs> people will be like what the fuck what is going on you know talk? you know the other interesting sport is there's a game that and they actually use uh, i'm trying to think of what i think it might be on jackass too where it's um this game where you've got these these paddles and it, it kind of looks like a giant game of squash and I think that it's a, a game from Israel. Um, and it might be called like, it's like called, uh, what's it called? I just can't remember what it's called. So anyway. I'm, think, I'm thinking of a game that might have been on Jackass with paddles. I'm guessing it's just going to be something like Paddle Nuts or something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, let me explain what happened. They would take their, their pants down and start smacking each other with uh, Obviously. paddles. Obviously, <laughs> yes. And it Bend over, and I'm going to smack you on the ass and make sure I smack the back of your nuts at the same time with this massive paddle that's the size of an oar. Okay. <laughs> I, I've got to look it up now. We're just okay. going to call it Paddle Nuts. I guess, uh, I'm sure that's all they did. Most popular. No, hang on. Uh, uh, no, I can't find it. You just call it Paddle Sports of Israel. <laughs> <laughs> ah, what's it called? Uh. <laughs> or you can just do a Google search for um, bent over and smacked in balls with paddle. I mean, <laughs> that's, that's not going to take you to any nefarious websites. <laughs> oh, shit. I look, I, oh, hang on. Okay, I found a picture. Okay. Okay, it's called J. J-, J- it's called Jai Alay. Jai Arrow. Jai, it's called Jai Arrow. <laughs> Hang on, I'm going to Wikipedia. It is a sport involving a bouncing ball off a wall, spaced, uh, spaced by accelerating it at high speed with a handheld wicker cesta. C-E-S-T-A. Fair enough. There are a lot of words in here that uh, I just can't pronounce. I'm sorry. Well, yeah, these things happen. We're going to have to create another website here of explaining all these other sports <laughs> around the world. Weirdsports.com. <laughs> I was going to type in paddlenuts.com, but, you know, I'm, I'm not game. I don't want to see that. <laughs> nah, nah. Fool me one, shame on you. Um, so, yeah, that's a couple of weird sports. Can you think of any other weird sports that you've – the jump out of you. Obviously, they've got the. Have you ever seen that um, that oil wrestling? I think it's from Greece. No, no, I've not watched that. Um, 
No, the other thing that's that's um close to being odd mm. that I watch uh occasionally and I'm not yeah. saying I'm not even saying often, like it might be once every two or three years yeah. is uh hot dog eating contests. Oh, you watch that. Sometimes I watch it. Just look at these these fat oaks in America just scoffing hot dogs going Yeah. I can see how this is big in America. Some some blokes are sitting there eating a shit ton of hot dogs one day and going, I reckon I could be the best in the world at this. Let's have a competition. And there's some sponsors come along going, yeah, we'll put money into this. Why not? Next thing you know, these blokes are scoffing hot dogs and getting paid a million dollars for the, for the fucking fun. And we're looking around going, what the fuck is wrong with the world? <laughs> Yeah, it's weird when there's a there's something that is taken and turned into, and Americans are really good at it, like putting the infrastructure around a pastime and making it a a sporting event, like fishing, like competitive fishing. That's another one where it's like you take this pastime, which is supposed to be relaxing, and every so often you get a really big fish, and that's like oh, excellent. And now all of a sudden they've got. They fucking look like NASCAR drivers and they're using range finders and they've got like gear that cost a hundred thousand dollars. And that, you know, the other one that's a bit weird is the competitive barbecuing circuit. That's another <laughs> one. Have you ever seen the competitive barbecuing circuit? No, no. Oh my God. That's the exact same sort of shit. They all look like NASCAR drivers. Um, and they talk about like how they're going to present their meat and, you know, have they got the? Have they got the? Uh, oh, what do they call it? That they, they like to have the ring of smoke around the outside, but it's got to be the right color and the right depth and things like that. It's pretty amazing, really. You always end up being hungry watching that. That's insane. Yeah, I'm just looking into uh, Joey Chestnut. Which Joey Chestnut? He's the uh, Joe Chestnut. He's the world champion of hot dog eating. You okay. know what his net? You know what his net worth is? I, I'm going to guess. Yeah. Right, competitive. He's a competitive eater. Yes. I'm going to say 1.6 million. Two million. Wow. He's. What's the, some of his records? He's eating 141 hard boiled eggs in eight minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. He ate 390 shrimp wontons in eight minutes. Wow. My God. This is insane. You know what I want to see him do? I want to see him try and eat 141 Mrs. Max pies out of the Bay Marita Servo that have been sitting there for a week in eight minutes. I want to see him try and eat one of those in eight minutes. (laughs) You've seen the movie Howard Stern Private Parts, haven't you? No. Ah. There's a really good scene where they they he gets a woman in to swallow a I think it's a twelve inch kielbasa sausage and it ends up a guy quits on his radio show because of it. It's really good. Just reminded me of that. I don't know why. Fair enough. Yeah, we've, we've kind of gone in a different direction here. Yeah, remember when we used to have a rugby league podcast? Yeah, yeah. We should we should we head back in that direction? Yeah, what what other rugby league news do we have? Oh, I don't know if there's any others. Have we had any emails? And that's kind of what I was going to get at. You know what we did? Okay, we had an email. Let me just open the email machine. It was from somebody that said their email didn't go through on our website. Um, and it's I got it a couple of days ago. And let me see. Let me. Does, it, does this mean we need another website? <laughs> <laughs> if you if you're looking to run a website, um. <laughs> Hang on, let me find it. It was from Lee, um, and he it was some suggestions and questions that he had. Okay. So sh- should we uh, – suggestions for the podcast? I'm, um, happy, I'm happy to do with this now. Okay, okay. He says, for your, for your information, I can't send an email from Fergo on the Freak website email. He says – your podcast entertains and informs me and is enjoyable to listen to. And I started listening to it this year, but have seen Freaky on Twitter for a few years. I'm sorry, Lee. Anything you say me. I'm sorry. Um, suggestions for the podcast. Top 17 most overrated plays in 2017, in 2021 in the NRL. Uh, and he says, 
uh, will Mitchell Moses and Gutho make the list? They may not with all the competition. That's a good point. Um, no, they make the list. You reckon? Yeah, they were the first they were going to put on there. Overrated. Yeah, overrated, yeah. Halfback. Yeah, it's hard to go past Moses. Uh, okay, here's another point. Why do the media have a love affair with Mitchell Moses and Clint Gutherson? You can tell Lee's one of our listeners, can't you? Um, <laughs> yes, they are first graders and they do their job, but definitely nothing that would entice me to go and pay money to watch them play. This is a bizarre story, and comments on Twitter suggest that I may have perhaps... Uh, be perhaps accurate in my observation um because there was that story that's come out about gutherson's manager saying he should be worth a million bucks and if i was a if i was the eels i'd say go and find a million bucks man we would wish you all the best yeah yeah go go take that money take that money yeah. um god imagine paying Gutherson a million they're paying too much now here's yeah. his next point if Reynolds and Cody Walker play game three in origin this year, would New South Wales have got the clean sweep? And he says they only would have had the perfect spine with all bunnies in it. And he says, by the way, this is from the Queenslander. I tend to agree with him. Hey, I think they would have won that game and got the clean sweep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, they probably could have won the game if they had Luke Brooks in there instead of Mitch Moses. <laughs> That's a good point. Uh, Moses' game this year has gone backwards. Yeah, it has. Um, and there's no no reason for it. Like he's He is one of the best halfbacks in the game when he runs the ball more often than he kicks and will go sideways. But he's been getting so sideways and kicking far too early, mm. passing far too early. He's not engaging the line at all anymore. No, no. He's playing timid. And you're not going to be, you're not going to threaten any any defensive line if you're a timid half. No, he's just, uh, you don't have to worry about him anymore. No, he will, he will tell you what he's going to do before you need to worry about making the wrong decision defensively. Yeah, yeah. Um, his next, his next point that he makes: players that you would pay money to see. I'm the number one champ, cheese. Uh, number two, uh, Tommy Turbo. Number three, Teddy. Number four, Nathan Cleary. Number five, Latrell Mitchell. Who would be your top player to pay money to see? Hmm. That is I, a think, good one. I think when he's he's fit and healthy, Tom Alolo would be pretty close for me. Yeah. Benji I Marshall, Latrell. Yeah, ben, Benji was the first player that I wanted to actually go and see and I was happy to spend money that I sometimes didn't have to do it. Yeah. That was when I was studying and I was living in Newcastle and it was an absolute pauper. I'd still try and find a way to travel by train down to Sydney to watch Benji play. Wow. Uh, just phenomenal. Phenomenal. I'm trying, I'm trying to think who else you'd, you'd watch now. I think Harry, like, I'd put, put Harry Grant on the list. Oh, would you? Yeah. I'd put uh, Latrell Mitchell and Cody Walker. I love watching them play. Oh, yeah. There's no doubt they are brilliant. I'm I'm most happy with Tom Trebojevic. I, I I think he's playing unbelievable footy at the moment. I'd pay to watch him play. Brian Toto, love watching him play. Yeah. I'm trying to think of who else. Uh, no one else really stands out for me that I can think of. Next year, I'll, I'll happily go and pay to watch Moses and buy. Why next year? Because he won't be at the Tigers. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> just you're just everyone thinks man this dude really loves Moses and Bai and you're just cheering the whole time because he's not in a Tigers jersey yeah I just think yeah Moses god that's a great play they're going, but he dropped the ball you're going yeah but he did it in a Dragons jump but not in a Tigers one <laughs> <laughs> okay the next point he has kicking in play why oh why do a majority of players generally kick the ball on the full to the opposing player catching it as opposed to doing what Jack Gibson said, kick to the seagulls. It's a basic mathematical concept that even I can grasp. You kick it and it bounces and you get extra time to get there as well as the unpredictability factor. It is annoying as a fan to watch the opposition player catch it on the full 
And in my mind, I'm thinking that is a crap play. All right. The mechanics behind this is, and it doesn't get executed as properly as it's supposed to all the time. The idea is you put it up high enough so that your defenders get a chance to get down there because you're supposed to put them up high into the corner. So you use the sideline to block the uh, the recipient of the ball anyway from going on one side. So your defenders are going to come down on the other side of the field where the field of play actually is. Come down there and you can hem him into one corner and that way the attack for the next two, maybe three runs are all going to go to the same side. So it makes it easy to just stack your defense on one side and then just bog them down into that one area for three tackles. And then you start to get on top of them in the set. That means the team with the ball after they've caught it, they're probably only going to get two, at best, three runs where they'll actually get to make some genuine meters. Other than that, they're doing one outs and they're going, they're going to the only side they can possible because the short side is too short. That's the, that's the mechanics behind it. Yeah, basically put them in a position they don't want to be in. Put them in a position where they're trying to just work it out of from the sideline in their own area. Yeah, they've um, got to take a risk by passing two off the ruck, mm. or they've just got to go one out, one out, one out, and hope that one of those runs gets some post-contact metres and goes for 10 metres, and they can actually get a little bit off, you know, get the defenders on the back foot. It's all about trying to set up for the next three tackles of defence. But um, yeah. too many halves don't kick it high enough. So the uh, the opposition get to catch the ball and they get to make those 10 metres before they engage the defensive line. So it's kind of a moot thing. I also think what we're seeing because of the seven tackle set you give away, if you kick it over the dead ball line, in some cases it's, it's safer for a, a team to put a bomb up high and hope that the fullback does catch it yeah. on his own line because he doesn't want to take the, he did, well, he doesn't want to take the tackle. Yeah, he does, and he doesn't want to take the risk of that ball bouncing in the hands of the, the team that kicked it either. Yeah, yeah. It, like it's normally what you see is when a team does kick for the seagulls as as Lee says, they're really deep in their own half. And then, you know, you've got to have a really good kicker because a lot of it, we've got to give credit to the fullbacks. A lot of the fullbacks are very good at positional play. Mm-hmm. Um, and But there are times when, like Mitch Moses is a really good example. And now it sounds like we're piling on Mitch Moses because we are. But he will put up a bomb and it will fall. It won't be, it won't be all that deep and it won't put the player under any pressure at all that the team that he's going to get smashed when he gets it it's just sort of in a nothing area and i think we do see a few too many of those sorts of kicks especially yeah. from someone like mitch moses that's just yeah that's the thing if, if moses could kick those higher mm. then they'd be perfect because the one skill he does have with kicking is he's got a, a great way of making that ball come down so that the fullback or the winger is unable to take it on the full in their own end goal. It's always just inside the field of play, no matter how hard they want to try. They can't yeah. take it dead on the full. They can't take it in their own end goal. He's very good at measuring that, but he's he needs to get it higher so he can get his defenders on top of that bloke straight away. That's his problem because now the uh, the opposition take the they take the catch and then they look up and they go, oh, the defense isn't here yet. Off they go. Yeah, I know when uh, when we've played Parramatta the last few times the Panthers have played them, and that's been a really big part of the entire game is just that um, Dylan Edwards would not really be under any pressure from the Parramatta kicking game. And meanwhile, on the other side of it, Nathan Cleary's kicking game, which is just, it's the best in the, the game. Like his kicking game starting to get up towards like, you know, the, the Stuart John sort of, having to rate him against them as opposed to his peers at the moment. Mm. Um, it, and it, it just, that's one of the things where we kill Parramatta in is their kicking game just does nothing to worry us. That's right. Um, anyway, he ends the email up by saying, good podcast. Thanks for reading and all the best with the podcast and the rugby league project. Thank you. I'm very pleased with how I've, what I've done with Rugby League Project. He says, <laughs> can I just say, I don't have anything to do with Rugby League Project. It's all Andrew. Um, he says, thanks, Lee, the Wayne Bennett fan from Queensland. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
my apologies to uh, to you for being a Queenslander, but thanks for all the other great stuff there. How dare you, Andrew? He's one of our loyal listeners. Yeah, but he's a Queenslander. Where is that? Maybe he's, <laughs> maybe he's a nice Queenslander. Maybe he's a Queenslander the same way Greg Inglis was a Queenslander. Not at all. Or Sam Thiday. Sam Thiday. Or Sydney, Lottie Takiri. Sydney born Queenslander. Yeah, or Lottie Takiri, or Petro Seven Seaver, Craig Smith. Speaking of that sort of stuff, I wrote Brad an article Thorne. for the, uh, the League Unlimited program thing earlier this year. Yeah. And it was very clearly from the, from the outset a tongue in cheek piece because it was about the number of players who played for the state that they didn't originate from. And yeah. when I mean originate, I mean they weren't born in that state. Yeah. I know that's not the rule that's in place for Origin, but that's that was the premise I was using. Mm-hmm. People were saying that I was, um, you shouldn't be putting comedy pieces in a serious program. And went, oh, where's that fucking rule written? Yeah, you can write whatever the fuck you want. Yeah. It's my idea, so I'll fucking put whatever I want in there. Yeah. I like that when it comes to when it comes to the things that I write, I know that I like to take my opinions and I really like to put them forward to the reader and fucking bludgeon them with it. <laughs> yeah. I I tend to start with the uh the the setup approach. Yeah. And then go, This is my view. It's not just my view, it's now fact. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I know there's an, there might be an alternative view to it, but it's wrong. That's pretty much the approach I'll go with. So I, it's kind of bludgeoning. Yeah. But in more of a condescending manner, I guess. So I save that sort of stuff for the podcast now. I used to write, I used to write a lot of stuff that, uh, like I never wrote anything I didn't believe, right? Yeah. But I would sometimes take aim at other rugby league playing nations, so to speak. And I would set out like the statistics and things like that and bring up quotes from their players and their coaches and things like that. Now I save that stuff for the podcast. So I've, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm much the same. I, I barely write anymore. I can't remember the last time I wrote an article on my, my blog thing. Yeah. It's been a while. Hey, mm. you've got heaps. I... You've got heaps of articles on my website, by the way. Yeah, I think I've written more for your website than my, my I, blog. I, I, I wouldn't be shocked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, that's, that's, uh, I was supposed to, to do something about that and never did. But anyway. That's all right. I can help you with that when you get time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah whenever that is. Yeah. <laughs> I sleep far too much as it is at the moment, so I need to I need to cut down my sl- the amount of sleep I do so I've got, I can make time that way. Yeah, cut it, cut it in half to one and a half hours. Yeah. And uh, but you know, we had this exact conversation. I swear to God, about two years ago, where mm-hmm. I was like, "Oh, dude, I'll buy the podcast. I'll buy the uh, website address for you because I'm always going to do that." And you're like, "Yeah, okay, all right, we'll do it in the off season." And then, yeah. then I think we ended up watching all the the uh, Die Hard movies instead and podcasting right. about it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be honest; it was a better use of our time. She, yeah, it was fun. <laughs> Um, by the way, speaking of podcasting, when are you going to get that other dude that is a big part of Rugby League Project on the podcast? I wouldn't say he's a big part. I'm, I'd say that he is the heart and soul of that damn thing. Oh, that's what you said to me before. You were like a uh, bludger. He hardly does anything. That's what you said. Well, to me. We, we've, we've both had our moments of being absolute bludgers. I'll be honest on that one. <laughs> It's this weird thing where there's, there's, I can't remember. There's been too many times when we've both been dedicating a shit ton of time to the website. It's usually only just one of us at a time, and so there's been periods where I've just been completely absent on there, and he's just doing a ton of work, and then he'll be busy with his job, and then all of a sudden I'm doing a ton of work on there. And it's just one of us always working on it. Uh, it's just a, a, none of it's planned. It just seems to be the way things fucking work. Yeah. But um, yeah, Sean's um. Sean, Sean would be great to get on to have a chat about it because he, the whole website and everything about it is all him. Um, and I approached him one day and just said, you know what? I was thinking about doing a, a like, credit my first book, yeah. which is just going to be probably for rugby league, like season by season sort of brief analysis sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. I said, I don't see the point in me going through and doing all of that on my own while you're doing all of this on your own. Why don't, we just, why don't I just give my stuff to you and we just put it on the website? And he's going, hmm. <laughs> Be my guest. 
Far out, eh? He just gave me the keys. Here, you put all this shit in. You go for it. And I was like, okay, no worries. And the uh, the uh, global financial crisis hit, and I got made redundant from the job I had. So I started working on the website a lot, mm-hmm. and then got work, and then stopped working on the website a lot. <laughs> yeah, and it just sort of ebbed and flowed between that sort of stuff. But uh, yeah, it's um, it'd be good to get him on there. I'll have to. I have to send him a message and, and tee up a time with him. Yeah, send him a message. I know that he listens to the podcast every so often. Yeah, um, great. He's a great human, Sean. I won't. Yeah. Hear, I won't hear anyone say a bad word about him. No, no. But, but get, um, on, get on the webcast, the the podcast, you bastard. <laughs> it's um, I'll uh, the, the only thing that might be an issue is um, <laughs> we we don't exactly have a guest friendly podcasting time that we record things. <laughs> Well, <laughs> like, who's well, fault's that? Be honest, let's be honest, right now, it's a quarter to one in the morning. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you whose fault it is. It's mine. It's always mine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, because when Freaky records the episodes on his own, he's doing that like when the sun's up and, you know, it's normal and other people are up and they're, they're awake and doing normal human things. I only I only sleep for about four or five hours every day, so I force other people to be up at the time I'm available. I like it. <laughs> That's how you're supposed to live. You take you take people you take people's existence and you shove it into a small <laughs> spot where it works for you. <laughs> That's exactly what I'm doing. You basically just you take a life that is full of happiness and joy and you just strip away everything you don't need until they just serve you. That's all right. You, you, you're on my fucking time now. Yeah. <laughs> You'll work to my fucking schedule. <laughs> Our schedule. <laughs> See? See? I've, I've already got it happening. We are one. <laughs> oh, shit. Oh, it's so funny. Um, so, yeah. So, we'll get, we'll get him on. And we've also got another special guest that you've lined up sometime in the next few weeks, I guess, is it going to be? With any luck, hopefully this weekend. Ah, oh, that'd be awesome. That'd be yeah. really cool. Uh, do we know what we're doing yet? Oh, we're going through that website. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. going to be good. That will be good. That will be good, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I should really get around to doing another history episode as well, because I don't think we've done one for a long time. It's been a while now. Um, mm. See, that's where it turns around, you see. Yeah. You know, we podcast on your time, but get just get the history episode sorted, Andrew. I'll be waiting. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I've, got to, I've got to organise that. <laughs> oh, shit. And we should uh, one day put out a poll and ask people what they want me to do a history episode on. Yeah, that'd be cool, actually. Yeah. I, you know, I've, I've been thinking about... Um, the episode we talked about where something happened on the way over for a kangaroo tour. Do you remember that one? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've been thinking about that a lot lately. It'd be cool to do that one. All right, we'll we'll try and tee that up for maybe this weekend if I'm if I can get that done as well. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Because yeah, I've been thinking about that one a lot. I think it's a a really interesting story and one of those stories that people probably don't even know about. Yes. Um. And got a very unique angle about it too. Yeah, very, very unique. So that would be very cool. Um, so, yeah, I reckon we wrap this one up and we prepare for the next episode. Sounds like a plan. Um, so, everyone, make sure you check us out on the socials. We're on Twitter and Instagram at Fergo Freak Pod. We're on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, um, MySpace. <laughs> Don't forget the MySpace account, people. Um, so check us out on all of those, subscribe, like, um, you know, do all that sort of great stuff, uh, especially over on YouTube, get over there and, and get a hope of likes going on over there. That'd be fantastic. Um, what else is there? You can check out Freaky's website at, uh, leaguefreak.com. Yeah. It's... Rugby League Project at rugbyleagueproject.com. You can check out the podcast website. com. There you go. Check out all these dot coms. They're there. We've got heaps of them. If you want to yeah. run internationalrl.com, get in touch. Mm-hmm. Nightmare Rugby League, that'll be out there soon. Nightmarerugbyleague.com. <laughs> it's all going to be happening. So uh, make sure you check all those out. Also, don't forget, 
We've both got Patreon, so check out um, patreon.com league freak and patreon.com slash RL project. Yes. Check those out. Donate to those if you can. That would be absolutely fantastic. Um, and I guess that wraps this fella up. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Catch us all next time.